Tom, that I don't think you've memorized the 119. Anybody memorize it? <laughs> Nobody. Okay. <clears throat> it's said that every other verse in this psalm uh, has something about the Word of God. Go back to verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled who walk in the law of the Lord. So there, that's one aspect of the Word, the law. The next verse has what? His testimonies. Verse 3, walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts. Verse 5, thy statutes. Verse 6, thy commandments. Verse 7, thy righteous judgment. Verse 8, thy statutes. It makes a tremendous, <laughs> tremendously interesting reading to go through. Again, to, to keep us kind of riveted down to the Word of God. But what I wanted to uh, remind you of here, that at least... Um, I don't know how many, uh, six, eight times the psalmist says, quicken me. Do you remember what, what does it say there in Hebrews? The word of God is what? What is it? You're right, don't worry, go on, say it. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword that's verse 12 of the uh, fourth chapter well this is what the psalmist is saying here <clears throat> notice in, the, in uh, verse 25 my soul cleaveth unto the dust quicken thou me according to thy word now notice what he says in the first place my soul cleaveth to the dust which again is an act of humility, he, he, he has no self-trust, he has a distrust in himself, which is always a healthy thing to have. Our confidence is not to be in ourselves, our confidence is to be in God. I think people are in trouble when they start, when they start teaching uh, things from the standpoint of experience. It's not a case of uh, uh, how, uh, however much experience you have, it's not going to do me too much good. I've got to have it from God's Word. I've got to build. I've got to be established again on the Word of God. And here he says, My soul cleaveth, cleaveth to the dust. Quicken me according to thy Word. Why? Because the Word of God is quick and is powerful. Now, we, we think of quick as somebody running and say, Why, well, he was quick the way he was. But it doesn't mean that actually. It means it's it's... It's something that stabs me. It's something that awakens me. It's something that provokes me. The Word of God is quick. Well, it's quick in the sense again that if I've got it hid in my heart, God brings it very quickly to my remembrance. I don't have to wait and say, oh, I wish Gabriel would hurry up. They've got the computer wrong upstairs. And uh, I wish that... No, 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 no. Thy Word have I hid in my heart and then immediately God touches it and it's quick and it comes to my defense or it comes to build me up it comes to stimulate me or again it's quick to it's quick to correct me or again it's quick to cast me down if I'm getting exalted the word of God is quick and powerful quicken thou me according to thy word in verse 37 he says turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and Quicken thou me in the way. You remember that word over in Exodus? I, I being in the way, the Lord met me. And this is where I'm going to be quickened because I'm right in the way of obedience. I'm in the way of truth. Verse 40 says, Behold, <clears throat> I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Now again, as we said earlier, I have a responsibility in this. His word will quicken me. His word will inspire me. His word will correct me. His word will lift me up. Or his word may cast me down. But look at the human side of this. Back in verse 23, 
It says, Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. And right through this one psalm, particularly again, it's, ma ma it's statutes, commandments, precepts, laws. It, it, they're repeated over and over again. Thy precepts, thy commandments, thy laws, thy statutes, thy judgment. They run right through this amazing 119 psalm. And David says, I've meditated upon them. Notice he says it at the end of the 48th verse. My hands also will I lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. Which is another way of saying, I'll meditate in thy laws, I'll meditate in thy commandments. Now verse 88, he says, Quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Now quicken me after thy loving kindness, it is urge me to seek after thy loving kindness and thy tender mercies. In another psalm he says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. Well, if I'm going to get rid of those They'll come to everybody, there's no question, you know, when people, we used to sing a hymn, I remember in England we were singing, uh, one day I'm lifting on the mountain underneath a cloudless sky, I'm drinking of the fountain that never can run dry, and I was sitting next to Dr. Fawcett on the platform that day, and he gave me a nudge and said, well, look at all those folk, Len. don't you wish you were like them? Living on a mountain underneath a cloudless sky, drinking of the fountain that never shall run dry, he said, uh, I find my experience more in a hymn that says, Days of darkness still come o'er me, and sorrow's path I often tread, but the Saviour still is with me, and by his path and by his hand I'm safely led. There's no immunity from temptation as long as you live. As long as you and I live, we're going to be tempted. As long as you and I live, we're going to try. People want the, you know the biggest temptation to believers is to want to live without temptation. Now, if I have God's Word hid in my heart, after all, the greatest, holiest man that ever lived was who? Okay. And uh, after the uh, anointing of the Spirit came, he was led of the Spirit into the... And there he was tempted for... Forty is a sign of probation. How many books are there in the Old Testament? Oh, you don't know? Well, okay. <laughs> 39. So Matthew is number what book? 40. 40, all right. And it's a period of probation for the Jews because God sent his Son amongst them for a period of testing to see what they do with him. Now Moses was how long, how, how, many, how many days was he in the mount? And then he came back, and he went back for another... And, and, and it, it, seems, I, I, it seems to me it's an incredible thing, but, but I can't find that he ever ate anything for 80 days, not 40, because he went straight back in the mount. All right, after the resurrection of Jesus, he was with them for how many days? Well, there was 40 days of temptation after anyhow. There was 40 days of trial for them. Now, Jesus was in the, in the wilderness, and, and, and the scripture says he was tempted what? No, but he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Now, temptation is not sin unless you yield to it. Temptation is a normal Christian life. But again, let's consider this, there are degrees of temptation. There are temptations to the mind. There are temptations to the body. And there are temptations to the spirit. There are temptations to, to children. There are temptations to youth. And there are temptations in old age. I've given an illustration for years of 
how when I was a little boy, maybe you've heard me say, I, I, my mother made the best jelly and jam in the whole city. And when it came to fruit, you know, I used to say, Mum's going to start making blah, jam again. All I got was to lick the dish out, you know, when she cooked it, and I used to get a spoon and scrape it. Man, when I'd scrape that dish, a fly couldn't have got a mouthful off it. I really skinned that dish. I really, really, you know, I should eat boil the fruit. Oh, I used to stay there and get this big thing in my and go around with a spoon and blah, 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 and stick my finger in and clean it up, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then uh, she put it up in what we call a pantry, a, a dark room, you know, and she'd leave it there and have it all labeled strawberry and raspberry and gooseberry and all, bilberries and all the other jams and jellies she made. And, you know, I'd go steal it. I'd go up and steal it. When she'd gone out some time later, I'd go steal it. And, and you know, I'd, I'd take the top off and I'd get a spoon and go like this. Ooh, that was great. That was great. Then I'd suddenly, oh... Oh, yes, but there's a great tribulation ahead. I'm going to get spanked for this. <laughs> so I may as well take another spoonful and, uh, you know, it's worth getting spanked twice. It's delicious. Then I take another and before long it's... Mm, I didn't intend to take so much. I lick the spoon and smooth it over and put the lid on and put it right at the back of the shelf, you know. You know, somehow my mother got a habit of going to the back of the shelf first. And I remember one day she brought this, this out and I was in the yard, in the garden, we had a, a, in England you don't call it a yard, you call it a garden. You say you have a vegetable garden, you have a flower garden, you have a lawn if you have, if you have grass. And I was working in the, I guess, in the flower garden because I liked flowers. My dad liked them, he, he did an awful lot with flowers. We all had a beautiful garden. I was working there, mother called Len, Lenny, she called it. Lenny. And I thought, now what's she after? Oh, I, she... Oh, just before I came out, she got cooking things out, and she got some dough. I guess she's making pie, and I guess she's going to use some jam, and I guess something else, too. <laughs> I said, Mummy, I'm, I'm busy. She said, All right, dear. And she called about 50 minutes after, Lenny, I want to see you. Mummy, I'm still busy. Okay, dear, it will do when Daddy comes. Oh, no, it won't. Oh, no. No, that, that, that couldn't wait till Daddy came. As I say, my Daddy believed in laying on of hands, and he could lay them on, too, when he, when he started, you know. And I would go in, and, I, and she'd say, did you steal? And, oh, yes, I had to admit that I'd done it. Now, you know, I, I usually give that in the part of a message on Peter to, you know, help people after the week. They always just say, I scalp them or skin them or something, so... I try and build them up and on the first epistle of Peter, the first chapter there on, you know, what, what is consistent with a Christian life, what isn't, temptation isn't. And I use temptation, I use the illustration of jelly. And, you know, uh, by the next meeting, before I leave next morning, some lady comes with a bag of jelly this size, you know, jars of jelly. I come home with loads of jelly. So I'm, I'm trying to find a way to use the illustration on money and see if it works that way. <coughs> but... <clears throat> you know, when I, I, I stayed in a home recently, a beautiful home, and you know, I, I was in real victory. I realized at the end of the week I hadn't stolen jelly once. <laughs> you say, well, you've outgrown that kind of temptation. Well, that's what I'm saying. You see, you can outgrow certain temptations. And there are certain temptations you don't know till you come to a certain age. A, a child will steal jelly, he'll steal cookies. A man doesn't steal them, he snitches them. But uh, he doesn't steal them, but he, he, uh, he isn't worried about any consequences. He knows his wife made them. She says, well, darling, help yourself any time you need one. He does it. A child is tempted on one level. A full-blooded young man is tempted in another area. Very often in the area of sex. This is a, this is a curse. If I didn't know the Bible said the number of a man in Revelation is 666, I'd think it was sex, sex, sex. Because we're a sex mad age. It has never been as wild, it's never been as acceptable. Perversion, uncleanness, violation of God's laws in this area don't mean a thing in, the way, in, our, in our present lifestyle. So temptation that works on a, 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 a boy up to 10 years of age wouldn't work on a 17-year-old boy. Temptation on a 17-year-old boy wouldn't work on a 6-year-old boy. Temptation to a 6-year-old boy wouldn't work on a man 60. Temptation to a man 60 wouldn't work on somebody that's younger. Is it one of the temptations that is not recognized as a temptation amongst young people particularly is prodigality. You say in, in morality, no, 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 I'm not thinking of that. We're prodigal. 
for instance, you say, well, I'm only 19, good night, Mr. Rainer's over 70, and I've got, I've got, well, I've got another good 50 years coming on. No, uh, if you go up the road there, and you care to take a nice inspiring walk in a cemetery, you'll find somebody died at your age. Sometimes you hear people say, do you know who the richest man in the building is? I say, there isn't one. I was in a meeting where a man pointed a man out. He said, that man there, I, I know for a fact he has $750 million. It's a man in the First Baptist Church in McAllen. Actually, he's the father of Senator Benson, the Sen one of the senators for Texas. And his old dad was in the meeting. $750 million. I said, it must be good when he tides. But anyhow, he's $750 million. No, he doesn't. What does he have? He has one beat of his heart, that's all he has. You see, we, we become so generous, we become so generous, we say, well, I, I have this or I have that. No, no, we don't. Now, you know, temptation does. Well, it, it's like trials of life. What do they do? In that epistle to Peter, you find this, that when Satan gives up on temptation, what does he swing to? He, he swings to fiery trial, which, which is a temptation. It may be over like that. You can, you know, the hymn writer says, I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power. When? When thou art nigh. Well then, is this the insulation I have? What, what do I have? I, uh, against me, I have the world, I have the flesh, I have the devil. What do I have for me? Well, I have the indwelling of the Spirit of God. I have the exceeding great and precious promises of God. I have somebody pleading at the right hand of Why do I stumble and stagger? Now, it's not failure on God's part. It's failure on my part not to appropriate those things that God has laid up for me. I can fight the devil off the way Jesus fought him off. How did Jesus fight him off? He threw the book at him in our language. Satan came and said, you know this? And Jesus says, yes, but it's written, get out. Throw the book at him. It is written, yes, but Jesus said, and, and notice again, Satan did not quote the scripture, he misquoted scripture, as people often do. Now you read that and, and do a little homework on that and see, see where, where the difference is between what Satan said and what the psalmist said. But again, you see, we, we have this defense mechanism, if you like, set up for us. There's no way that I'm going to grow in grace and in the knowledge of God without going through what De Jesus was what? He was tempted in all points like as we are. And, and, uh, and, and Hebrews says what? Of the Lord Jesus Christ that he grew in grace. He that spared not his own son. Well, if God didn't spare his own son from trial and tribulation and testing, is he going to spare me from it? Do you think there was any, any variation in the... Do you, do you think Jesus had his peaks and, uh, and had his... Uh, or, or as we say, do you think he had his highs and he had his lows in his spiritual life? I don't think he had. In his emotional life, yes. Because I read going into Gethsemane uh, that, that uh, he was very heavy. Now again, these boys, so many of them right now, teaching about, uh, um, uh, teaching about Abraham. But you see, uh, it says there in that <clears throat> what is it, 15th chapter of Genesis, yeah, it, it, that where, where after he makes a sacrifice, he took a half of us uh, from me. Genesis 15 and verse... Nine, he said unto him, Take me a heifer three years old, and a she-goat three years old, and a ram three years old, turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against the other. But the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now I don't care how much sacrifice you yield to God, whatever you yield, the old birds of doubt and fear and, and criticism and somebody else's opinion are going to try and steal that sacrifice that you made. And you're going to have to drive them off. How do you drive them off? Again with the word of God. It is written. This is what God says. Now remember that always stressing, you can be so rich. Do you know how rich Abraham became? Do you know what God wants you to have? But they never give the other side of the coin. It was one thing for him to make a sacrifice. It's another hint for him to, to let it stay there permanently. And again, in New Testament language, 
I don't care whatever commitment you make to God before long the challenge to the believer is come down from the cross and save yourself you see that brother isn't sacrificing like you're doing he doesn't say take as much time and look I mean he gets more favor than you do some people like him it seems the staff like him better than they like me and uh, but, but that's not your business what is that to thee follow thou me God's making you not them if he thought you needed that he'd put you there you see, get, get this sure in your life. If you're climbing the ladder of spirituality, if the devil can't keep you at the bottom, he'll help you to get to the top and then he'll push you over the top. Why? Uh, because so often, uh, as it says about uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, is it too... Uh, um, I forget the chapter, somewhere, somewhere there in... Uh, but, it, but it says of Uzziah anyhow. I think it's in the 26th chapter of either 1st or 2nd Chronicles that he, he was mightily helped of God until he became strong. He was a wise man. He was an inventor. He ran the nation very well. He took it over when he was 15 years of age. He ruled it for 50 years. And everything expanded. He had a Midas touch. He did marvelous things until he became strong and his strength was his weakness. He fell. Now look, you settle this in your mind. You're on the ladder of spirituality. You're in the service of the King of Kings. If God wants you on the top rung of the ladder, there's not a demon in hell or a deacon on earth or anybody else who's going to keep you from getting there. As long as you're humble and you walk with Him. If He doesn't want you there and you get pushed up by promotion and, uh, you know, your uncle happens to be the boss in this group and that group and they give you a promotion, you'll make it. You know, in the early days of the Salvation Army, which came, as we said yesterday, out of the, out of the revival that swept, uh, it had swept America and then it swept England. Do you, know, do you know the secret of the Salvation Army was this? William Boo had a large family, but he never promoted one of his, because they were children of the general. Now, they were on a military basis. You know, you became a soldier, then you became a corporal, then you became a major, then you became a lieutenant, and I don't know what in the world it was. And they had brigadier generals, and then they had finally the general himself. But he never gave any of his children accolades or he never gave them promotion unless they earned it. With the result that when his children became very efficient and they were very brilliant. I told you the mother used to put her head, hand round the head of each of them when they were in bed at night. And they were still babies and unconscious in sleep and she used to pray the same prayer every night. She said, I'm not raising children for the devil. And while they were sleeping she would pray this over them. God bless you darling sleep the world is waiting for you every one of them became distinguished poets writers preachers missionaries but you see when they got up and they got adequate to run the salvation army themselves they didn't like to take orders from daddy and daddy didn't promote them above other guys oh no you you get seniority when it when i think you should have it and so what happened he lost his family they broke up and went off here and went off there that was william booth after him, I saw William Booth when I was a tiny little boy. And I saw the second general, Bramwell. Oh, he was all personality. He had a shock, gray shock of, of white hair. Man, he was very imposing. But when his family was raised, he promoted them whether they deserved it or not. He gave them key positions all in the South. After all, he's my son, she's my daughter. Uh, just has a lovely personality to so do this job. What happened? The first general would not promote them except they were adequate and therefore he kept the Salvation Army intact. The second general promoted his family and he kept his family but he lost the army. They voted him out. You see, now that holds in a spiritual life. I'm quite sure of this. Uh, out of long experience and out of reading other people's lives and after conversing with some of the greatest men in the world. Men that seemed, they, they weren't at the starting line in the race, brother. They were a hundred yards behind. And yet they overtook so many men who were far more brilliant. I did not, I went to a Bible college in England for about eight months. When I got there, I was totally embarrassed. I was disintegrated the first week I was there. Because I'd had no, I, I, I left school in the eighth grade. I hadn't been to high school. I had to take uh, some lessons in English, which I certainly didn't master. 
And uh, I had every disadvantage, like the Irishman said, all my advantages were against me. <clears throat> I just didn't have a thing to go on. And you know, fellows would come out, we had an exam every Friday night, and the list was always put on the board. And you know, I was always in one important position, usually at the bottom, holding all the others up. And guys would come out, you know, with, uh, in England, you never get 100% marks. Nobody would ever give you that, not in university. It isn't healthy. Nobody does it. If you, if you get in the 90s, you're a genius. I'd be around the 40s, usually. These are the guys that all that. But I determined one thing. After one day receiving a book called Bounds, Power Through Prayer, I made up my mind I'd go through that book. I didn't go through the book, it went through me. But I anchored onto that truth <clears throat> that what Bounds says, it takes God 20 years to make a man. I said, all right, here I am, try it. And when other boys went to do things, now we did not have any basketball. Chadwick said, you've only one life, you don't have time to play games. <clears throat> there were no girls there. You get too interested in girls, they're distracting. Now I don't think, I, I, I think if I had a school I wouldn't be as rigid, I'd have that, but I certainly wouldn't enter competition. I wouldn't waste hours running after other groups and going all over the place, I wouldn't do that. I'd do it for health's sake. All the, all the uh, recreation we had with a pair of rubber shoes and we put on shorts and a swim shirt and we ran a five mile run every Wednesday afternoon. You could go with a fast group or a slow group. And part of it, you had to go through a river that was ice cold and nearly took your legs off. You didn't know if you had any legs by the time you got through. And that was the only exercise we had. See, Mr. Chadwick said, listen, gentlemen, you do this. This one thing I do. You don't have time for trivia. Now, this is again where discipline comes in. They do it, let them do it. Hey, we're going down shopping. Uh, oh, it's Christmas shopping. I don't have any money. Well, come with it. All right, I'll come and look at the windows. Why? Why? Now, now, this seems nitty-gritty. No, no, no. Perfection is made up of trifles. But perfection itself is no trifle. When I think of, uh, as I've mentioned before, the last time I went to the Bible School of Wales, Mrs. Howell said, come upstairs and talk. And we went and stood on the veranda, and as we looked over the ocean, over the sea there, then she turned around and said, you see that room? Daddy, meaning her husband, went in that room at six o'clock in the morning. And he didn't come out till six o'clock at night, and he did that every day for 11 months with the exception of the one day that his mother died. Now, do you know any, do, how many people, we talk about ability and we need stick ability. Could you stay 12 hours a day in a room for 11 months? What was he doing? He was building himself up in his faith. You don't fly, you don't leap from here to there in faith. You build yourself up in the Word of God. You get to the place where you're absolutely sure, again, that the secret is in Hebrews 11:6 that God is and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. But God has to do some refining, refining some correcting. If I'm going to have perpetual fire in my life, God can do a lot of stirring. What does Paul say to Timothy? Stir up the gift of God that is in thee. Well, uh, there's another uh, meaning to that word there. It is actually, it's the same as saying, keep yourself in revival. It doesn't say God will stir you up. It says you stir up yourself in your most holy faith. Or stir up the gift of God which is in the, by the laying on of my hands. Now again, I do not believe that my Christian, my love toward God needs to ebb and flow. I don't believe my faith in God needs to ebb and flow, but my emotions will change. David said on one occasion, my heart is fixed. Now, do you know that's about the only thing that is fixed? Sure, in a world like this, the world could blow up tomorrow. We're sitting on a powder keg. We don't know what in the world's going to happen through this uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. We, we, we could have third, third world war. World War Three on our hands before very long. We could have the first and the most awesome atomic war in history. We, we could have a holocaust that would supersede all other holocausts. We don't know what, but we know our heart, my heart is fixed, David said. His emotions weren't fixed. He had a son trying to pull a throne from underneath him and steal a crown off his head. His social life wasn't fixed. He didn't know where his enemies were. Everything else is fluid, but he says, my heart is fixed. But if my heart is fixed, God cleanses my heart through the blood. He corrects my head with a rod. 
And whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, now we don't, we, 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 we say because we love our children, well, I won't spank you this time. Well, you don't love him, that's why. You'll have to love him, you'll have to spank him twice as hard up the road for the ones you miss now. Because ch children don't understand love like that. There is correction with love. You don't beat the daylights out of him, but you correct him. And Proverbs again says, if you correct him, you won't kill him. Now, God has promised so much to Abraham. Sure, he's going to have sand children like the sands by the seashore. But when he's made his sacrifice, he has to beat the birds off. In a school like this or anywhere else, y your eyes so very often turn sideways. What's she doing? What's he doing? Now, God's making you. He isn't making a gaffy. He is in one sense, but he isn't in another sense. He's making you. He's maturing you. He's bringing you to maturity. He's bringing you to the place where he can strengthen you. He's bringing you to the place where he, uh, he just takes Peter and James and John. Maybe out of this class, God's got three select persons that he's going to lead to eventually to leadership somewhere in the world that you don't dream of even now. I remember when I went to Bethany in 1950, I went first, and then we went to live there in 58 as a family, and I'd been many times in between. But I remember one night a young man came out, <laughs> I think in 1950, uh, 50, 50, I got a 50 or 51, and, and he came to the altar, he was a nice, clean-cut Lutheran. He had been saved through Ted Egri's ministry. He came out that night wanting to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and as soon as he hit the bench there, he, he let out a roar, that they said you could hear, you know, a mile away. Just a groaning in his spirit for God. Oh, God, he said, cleanse me and fill me with the Holy Ghost. And the joy of the Lord came on him. He's one of the best leaders they have in the world today. He's gone to a certain country and built a staff around him, and he's seen a measure of revival. I think of other kids that I looked at that didn't seem to have much potential. I remember when we went to Cliff College, Mr. Chadwick said, um, well, up to the first day, he said, uh, gentlemen, there were only men there, you know, gentlemen, are you sure God called you? Are you sure? If you are, nod your heads. We all nodded our heads. He said, it's a good thing he did. He said, I never would have called one of you by the look of you. <laughs> you know, that's a nice way to set off, isn't it? I mean, you know, all the confidence the school has in you kind of thing. But, but, but God is going to do his probing. He's going to do his correcting. And he says, you made your sacrifice, you'll have to fight the birds off. If God leaves you alone, the devil won't. And sometimes he uses the devil, because you remember Jesus said, uh, Satan has desired the... To who was it to? Peter again. Peter's going to be one of the... Other... Peter is going to be the man that stands up at Pentecost. It wasn't John that stood up. It was Peter, the problem boy, that God has purged and empowered... It's Peter that ran away when a girl put a finger up. Well, Elijah did the same thing, so it's in the apostolic succession, but he put his finger up, she put her finger up, he ran. But then you find him in, 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 uh, in Acts pointing his finger at the whole nation. He ran away from one woman, he stands up and he says, You crucify the Lord of glory. But look at his ups and his downs, and his ins and his outs, as it were. Peter talked to Jesus, more, not only more than any other disciple, he, he talked to Jesus more than all the disciples put together. And conversely, Jesus not only spoke to Peter more than any other individual, he spoke to Peter more than all the disciples put together. We don't like to see the weaknesses in him. And, and going down the road, Jesus said, when you get round the corner, Satan's going to try and ambush you. He's going to clobber you. But, cheer up, I prayed for you. Well, how many people have said that to you and you thought, so, you know, you can't pray for yourself. What are you praying for me for kind of thing? But Jesus didn't say, uh, Peter, I saw Satan down the road there. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I'm waiting for Peter. I'm going to beat him up. And I said, uh, Satan, you go back to hell and leave my little boy Peter alone. I love him. And I'll take care of him. The Lord didn't say anything to Satan. He said to Peter, I prayed for thee. Because what your faith needs, it needs a shaking, it needs a testing, it needs a purging, it needs a strengthening, and the only way you can get it is combat. 
It's one thing, you know, to put a lot of sketches on a board and put guys in combat uniform and then say, you know, when you meet the enemy, they don't all have blue eyes and they don't have, uh, all have white faces, some are yellow and some are this. That, that doesn't do you a hill of beans good. Five minutes of combat and boy, you, uh, you know, you can't uh, say mother, uh, uh, you know. They, they said when some of the troops, uh, American troops came to England, then got in combat in Europe and got into some wretched uh, situations that at the end of the day, some of them asked where the showers were. The others said, where what? I, I need a shower and I need some uh, old spy for something. <laughs> showers. Boy, the only shower you'll get is the sky starts leaking. You may not get a bath for the next two months. What? I get a bath every day at home. Well, Mummy isn't here to bring you a nice warm towel. You're in military service now. Get down to it. You see. And there'll come a time when, uh, and this is the big test after all, isn't it? It, it? It's when God takes what I call a protective atmosphere from us. It's easy to make vows in a meeting when emotion, emotions running high. And somebody puts their arm around you and says, Praise God, I'm glad you did it. Oh, you've made this commitment. I love you. I'll be praying for you. And tomorrow morning they run into trouble. And the next ten days, in fact, if you met them fifty days after and say, How many times did you pray for me after your promise? Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but, you know, the next day I got news from home. My sister was sick. And the next day my dad had a, uh, somebody scraped his bumper on his car. And the next day my grandmother fell down you know, pulling roses or something. And, and you had so many problems, you never thought about Mary Ann. You see, God takes that supporting atmosphere. You, you need it so long, then he takes it out and it becomes a walk of faith. Then the temptation comes, come down from the cross and save yourself. All right, stay and let's stay in the context of this 15th of Genesis. The fowls came upon, verse 11, down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Verse 12, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a horror of great darkness came upon him. Did you ever have an experience like that? Did you ever read a classic? Who wrote it? Teresa? It's a famous book. It's, it's more than one book called The Dark Night of the Soul. You never had one? Cheer up, you've got one coming. The Dark Night of the Soul. Oh, we make it all joy bells. Praise the Lord. Let's clap our hands have a great time. That's all right. I'm not against it. But I'll tell you what, there'll come a time when clapping your hands won't lift your spirit. There'll come a time when, when, when you sing a verse of a hymn and it'll fall dead on your ears and on your heart. And all you have is a naked trust in God. A horror of great darkness came upon him. So the hymn writer said, right, when he says, Days of darkness still come o'er me, but sorrow's path I often tread. But the Saviour still is with me. Again, the emotional side of my life is in chaos. But right down in the centre, you notice these boys when there's a hurricane, they say, well, we, we flew out over the Atlantic and we got right into the eye of the storm. There's a still spot in the middle of that thing that's swirling at whatever it's going, 150 miles an hour, whatever it's doing. But there's a dead spot in the centre, a dead silence, a dead stillness. The old Methodist used to sing a hymn that said, The storm may roar without me, my heart may low be laid, but God is round about me, shall I be afraid? Well, I didn't have it quite right. God is not only round about me, he's in me. How am I fortified against adversity? Because he said, Peace I live with you. No, no, no. He said, Peace I live with you. My peace I give unto you. What was the reward for the holiest man that lived in this, in, in this life? A crown of thorns. That's what he gives for living a holy life. His reward on earth was a crown of thorns. His reward on earth was desertion by some of his closest friends. And that will be the toughest thing in your life. After some, uh, something Satan that you know is directly a work of Satan or the powers of Satan. And then one day somebody breaks off in your life for no real reason at all. And you feel you've leaned on this person, and the Lord says, well, that's exactly why I took them away. You're leaning on Mary Jane or, or Jim Smith too much, and your prop goes. The Lord thy God is a jealous God. I remember once leaving in a plane from Manchester, England. I wasn't particularly fond of going to Ireland, because the plane was terribly slow. It, 
uh, you know, work with rubber bands or something. It, it just got to do, 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 you know, sit in the plane. It, it, it was only about 50 miles, and it took about an hour to go. And oh, it was a dreadful thing. And over the Irish Channel, it's always rough and dark. And when I got on the plane, we had to walk about 150 yards to the little plane that held about 20 people. And it was pouring rain. I put my coat collar up, you know. And when I got on the plane, yeah, I was wet. My trousers were sticking to my legs, and I sat in misery on that plane. And I thought, well, this is horrible. I'm flying all the way to Ireland in this pouring rain. And it's as black as night. And then the little thing got up in the clouds, and you know, that the, the, we were hemmed in in fog. And the motors were boo, going ten times louder, you know. And it was so dark, and we kept going. I thought, what a miserable... I'm miserable inside, I'm wet through, and I'm in a dark plane like this, and I can't see a thing, and then suddenly, whoop, like that, and it was like being like this. And I saw the top side of the clouds, and you know, I, it seemed I could see for hundreds of miles, and they were pure gold, because the, the sun was shining on them. And when I looked at the other window, it looked as though it was all beautiful snow, because they weren't getting the sun from the angle I was seeing it. Just, just exquisite. Now here on earth it was pouring rain. Here it's thick cloud, I can't see through it. When I get above the cloud, the sun is shining. Well, very often between me and God there are clouds. Days of darkness still come over me or over me and sorrow's path I often tread. But the Savior still is with me. Faith that is going to be trusted is going to be tested. You say, I've been having some tests. Well, cheer up, you'll get some bigger tests before long. Why? Because God has a bigger task further up the road. And if you haven't developed, as it were, the muscles of your heart, you won't be able to take the pressures when you get further up the road. Just by the same token, if you won't be led by somebody, you'll never make a leader. You may kick sometimes about something you're asked to do, but wait a minute, a bit further up the road you'll be giving commands to somebody and they don't want to do it either. Again, one of my old cliches, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. A man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. You, 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 you later say you go to a mission station in another country and you say to somebody, listen, we, we need somebody to dig a cesspool. Well, I didn't come here to be a, uh, dig cesspools. I came to be a missionary and give out tracts and talk to others. Well, you go do it. Do you ever do it? Oh, yes, I remember digging something at uh, Agape or somewhere. I didn't want to do it and I got blisters on my hands and boy, I'd, or it may be some other situation. And you say, but listen, I've passed through this school myself. So it gives you a sense of authority. All right, to rush over this then, uh, a, a horror of great darkness came upon him. A horror of great darkness came upon Jesus in Gethsemane. Do you think it was fun? He took with him the same three men. Why did he give them that glorious revelation on, on, on the mount? It was Peter and James and John that had it. And it should have fortified them when they got into the black hole of Gethsemane, but it didn't somehow. Now, don't you get too worried that people don't hear what you say, and uh, when you get to teach a class or become a leader of a group, that they don't all go on quickly, because by, by a long shot, the disciples didn't do that. As I said often enough, they said, Lord, teach us to pray, and when he took them on the Mount of Transfiguration to pray, they all fell asleep. Uh, and then he let them off that time and he took the same three men to Gethsemane and would you believe it, what did they do? And he came back a second time and they were... And he came back a third time and they were... I can't imagine that's real. I get all kinds of people asking, can I come and spend a day in prayer with you? Can I do this? I'd love to pray with you. Well, sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. If everybody came, I'd never get off my knees. But I know certain men, very, very few, that I'd like to spend a day in prayer with. I know guys I like to talk to. There are not many men I'd like to spend a day in prayer with. But they were permitted to pray with the greatest man of prayer that ever lived. And he prayed all night. Was that the reason they fell asleep? They weren't used to, they would no stamina, they weren't used to praying more than an hour or half an hour. And, and when he prayed on and prayed on and prayed on, it was too much for them. 
Wouldn't you, wouldn't you have thought that they would have learned that lesson there in the, uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration? And yet when they had a chance to stay with him in his most critical hour, they fell asleep. Or do you think God may be as grieved with the church today that we spend so little time in prayer? I'm convinced we've come into a form today of Christian humanism. That's all it is. We'll do it. You bless it, Lord. You've got to bless our TV program. You've got to bless our tracts we give out or our records or something. Who says he has? We want to do in the energy of the flesh. We sanctify the flesh to a great degree. We, we put personalities up just like the world does. There was a big rock, co rock concert recently up on the northeast coast. Various groups were there to sing. One of the star guys comes up. He demands $13,000 a night. Well, if I get 12000 for teaching here this week, it would be unusual. <clears throat> but uh, he gets 13000 for one night. And they don't pray. They just stand up and sing and pull faces. If it's singing, I don't know if it is. You make a noise with the guitar anyhow. 